Uh, I feel like somewhere is it? I know there's a bubble car around here somewhere. Raph, Raph, over here. Uh oh, there it is. Ah, whoa, jeez. That was like a Buick or something. This is no Buick, my friend. Oh, it's the one. Uh, it was one of the most ambitious cars ever made. The first car into production with GPS, the first car into production with sequential twin turbos, and the only car ever put into production with a three rotor engine. This is the Mazda Yunos Cosmo, the most bubble era car of the Japanese bubble era. 80年代初頭というバブル時代の真っ只中日本は世界屈指のスポーツ家高級車小型車その他ニッチな自動車を生産していましたしかし1995年のバブル破壊後こういった車は二度と作れられなくなりました英国政府による規制のため25年という長い間
I feel like I'm floating over the road. It feels like a like if I would imagine if like Rolls yeah. Royce put together a, a like an ultra aerodynamic coupe, it would be something like this. This is from 1990. This car came out. It, it, it's it's not quite like Rolls Royce ride, but it's like in that galaxy. The engine is crazy quiet, crazy smooth, just like totally you don't even know it's there. I think it was aimed at like that like business executive who wanted something that, that projects a sporty image, but when you get in it, really, it's just like, I just want total silence and quiet and like the ability to like enjoy my commute before I have to go deal with my ultra demanding job or like my <laughs> insane family. I just want to be left alone a bit. So that's the interesting thing about this. It's not exactly a Yakuza car. No. Even though this thing was sold only in Japan. Yeah. Uh, they talked about selling, exporting it. It's not that they would have driven a Mercedes. This yeah. is something that they were considering for export sale. This was meant to sort of rival uh, a Jaguar XJS or something. Ooh, yeah, yeah. And it's so much nicer. Yeah, this oh, is no. so well put together. If you, have you ever been in a Jag from the late 80s, early 90s? It's like, creaky, it's old, it's like horrible, yeah. fake wood. This thing is a spaceship compared to that car. And I would say, like, compared to anything General Motors is making at the time, it's, I pair this to a, like, uh, what is it, an Alante? Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> it is I unbelievable think, how far ahead it is. This is on par with, like, the stuff Mercedes was doing probably five years later. This is, it, yeah, wild. yeah, like you said, five years later. Now, think of five years earlier than this. Yeah. Mazda is making what? The FC RX-7, which looked like a 944 knockoff. Yes. The Mazda 323, which was like a box on wheels. Can you imagine? Most, most the interesting car they made was the MPV yes. minivan. And then a couple years later they have this. It, Why did you imagine? How is it possible? It felt, it would have felt like there was no end to the Japanese auto industry. We're in a, we're in a turbocharged three rotor engine, the only factory three rotor engine ever made by Mazda or anybody else. So let's, let's, let's see, I backed up the speed a little bit. I'm going yeah, about yeah. 110 kilometers an hour. So only not, sold as an automatic, uh, four speed auto. That's right, only sold as an automatic. There's no manual version. I'm gonna floor it just to see what happens. Yeah. Okay, okay, oh. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, well, um, well, all right, we got up to about 150 uh, clicks. Yes. Very drama free. It kind of takes a while for that auto box to sort of kick down and find the right gear. When it does, like that rotary power just comes on. And it's very quiet when it does it, but it's like it moves. This is the first mass production car with sequential twin turbos. The only car wow. that came before it was the Porsche 959. This is that was bar that was barely a car. That was a science experiment on wheels. Which which was so expensive it nearly like ruined the entire company of Porsche. <laughs> and this was just like Mazda. It's just like yeah yeah we'll figure it out no problem. Yeah. The other thing is this is everyone talks about how rotary engines are like big on horsepower and low on torque. This was like torquier than an American V8 at that time. Yeah. And it feels. It. Once it kicks it's down, it's some surge. Once it kicks down, it moves. It moves and it moves very seamlessly. In almost like that German way where you look down at your spit, you're like, oh, oh crap, I'm going, you know, 100 miles an hour. Like, you know, now, it's got that character to it. Before this car went into production, the biggest sort of thing that Mazda was making was a two rotor. So that's two rotors beside each other. Right. And when this thing was going into production, Mazda was doing a big Lama program even more and more rotors. You're talking about the 787B? Or yes. Yes, yes, yes. Mazda won Le Mans in 1990 right. with a four rotor. And that was up until, what, a year or two ago? A couple years ago, it was the only Japanese car company to win Le Mans outright. And that was a huge David versus Goliath story. Like, it, they took on Porsche, they took on uh, Jaguar, they took on all these like, big was, European racing brands. It was shocking the amount that like, Japan, like I said, was no longer becoming something which was doing copycat designs of other car companies. They were leading the world. Again, first sequential twin turbo in mass production, winning Le Mans. Like, this is not just that it's an equal of a, like a European GT. This is like, this is nicer than like almost everything else that was on sale. The thing is, if we are to talk about bubble air, we can't just talk about how good and, and wild and overbuilt and insane the cars were. We must also talk about um, what in some cases business failures they were. And I think this car uh, probably was, was <laughs> not a huge success for Mazda. This uh, typifies how much sense everything seemed to make right up until the moment when Absolutely did not. Yeah. 
I'm trying to imagine who is this car for? I mentioned that that hypothetical executive who's got a lot of coin to spend, wants a coupe, but it's also like, I mean, imagine if this was sold in America. Like, they're like, who the hell would want a three rotor engine? Like, even rotary heads barely understood those in those cars. Like, I, like, I don't, I don't get. It had a V8 or a V12. I can kind of understand, but like this very odd engine configuration, like their flagship engine in this body, in this interior, like it's a very strange car. And I think that, you know, you have this theory about how like the bubble's all about chasing the, the, the most narrowest niches you could find. Yes. Okay, so this was something which, okay. Hello. Oh, yes. Okay, from a stop, she moves pretty damn oh, fast. This is actually pretty. Oomphy. She doesn't really have the handling or the brakes to back it up, but in a, in a straight line. So uh, this car had precisely wow. as much as Mazda was like <laughs> legally allowed to claim in terms of power. This is like 280 horsepower. Yeah. It was like, or the 276 is like, they were like allowed to claim. But yeah. everyone assumes that this is a wildly underrated engine. And it, no, compared it to a Supra, like, this does not feel like a less powerful car. Now you've heard of people swapping this three rotor into like arc sevens and put, uh, you know, bolting it looks like a manual transmission. If you did that, man, you'd have a demon on your hands. Got a rocket. Because this this engine is sort of handicapped by its luxury car mission and its four speed automatic. But if yeah. you were to unleash it the right way, you, you, oh my it would be an ass kicker on your hands. Yeah. Yes, severely. Handling is, it's, it's pretty flat in the corners. Uh, you know, it's not a lot of body roll. It's very smooth ride, but like, that's really like, if you've ever driven an SL, like an SL will take corners, but it's not really what it's meant to do. It's not meant to excite you. It is yeah. meant to crush the road into yeah. submission. <laughs> and this is very much from that philosophy. Um, I, I just, I love how comfortable it is. Okay, like, this so, is the quietest car we've driven on this trip. All the, all the crazy oh bubble cars we've driven, like we're having a room level conversation. Yeah, I want to say that like the bubble era was not just Looney Tunes, tiny cars. It yeah. was not just uh, chasing the end, the end bit of performance sports cars. It was super luxury as well. The way I think of this is like you, you, you remember um, Toyota's project that became the Lexus LS. Yeah. And how they spent over a decade developing the ultimate luxury sedan and over engineering it and over building it, pouring all these resources, all this design to make the perfect, fastest, quietest, most well engineered car they possibly could. Mm -hmm. And then with this, Mazda says, hold my beer, bitch. <laughs> yeah, we're going for we're it. We're going harder. Yeah, you <laughs> yeah, got a yeah, V8, yeah. we got three rotors. Yeah, three rotors. Three rotors. It's gonna it's gonna be a coupe too. <laughs> Like, I love this dash. The dash is sort of spread out across the, Why? Um, okay. the entire, like, f like, interior front of the car. Like, there's over in front of you, I have average speed in uh, kilometers an hour. Why have, does it say average speed? They yeah. just, like, had all of this space, and we're like, uh, I guess we need to put something in there. A average speed. I can tell you how quickly you're getting there. I have in front of my left hand, I have the air conditioning uh, data, you know, the temperature and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a Speedo. The automatic that tells me it's in drive. Thank you very much. We're going forward. I, I, I had that, that. Uh, nailed, honestly. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the tack and the fuel gauge and the temperature gauge all the way off to the right. So it's like it, this whole thing sweeps across the dashboard. This thing has 20,000K on it. It's amazing. I was just in the new Mazda 3 hatchback, the brand new one. Dude, um, yeah. Really nice car. I actually loved it. Um, it's it's like the nicest like compact car you can probably buy right now. Right, right, right. It's almost like a Japanese Audi A3. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that that car looks and feels and drives like your brother's crappy Dodge Caliber he had in high school okay. compared to this. This is a spaceship. I cannot believe they came from the same company. They came from the same company and this came from decades before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Almost 30 years before. Yeah. Okay, so I know how you were talking about how the Supra is your dream. Yeah. This... This is yours, you think? This is kind of my dream of all these. Yeah. This is shocking. Okay, and the other thing is I was kind of hoping that this would be really, like, bad. That I would <laughs> dream about it. They're not bad. They're never bad. It's probably these bubble never cars. Bad. They're never really bad unless they have, like, a CBT, like, a, a poor Subaru we drove the other oh, day. Oh, my God. You are right, though. All of this stuff is fascinating. Now, this one that we're in is the... They had two versions. They had a sporty version and the luxury version. Mm. This is pretty clearly the luxury version, though. This is pretty clearly the luxury version. Yeah. But for some reason, this one doesn't have two features which were shocking for this car. One was a touchscreen. Right. And two, this is... The first production car with GPS. GPS navigation. Which is unreal. In the early 90s. In 1990. Yeah. I feel very secure and safe in this thing. Dude, the 
motor. Okay, so from the passenger seat, it does feel quick, but with it actually underfoot, it feels very sturdy. You know, what's interesting with these bubble cars is that you have a different idea of them in your mind than how they drive. Like some of those K cars, I thought would be slow and boring, and they end up being like, some of them would be really quick and charming. The Supra, I thought was better than I expected it to be, but I didn't expect it to be as good as the Legend, and it was, it was yeah. it'd be pretty fun. I figured this was like a slow cruiser that was just kind of whatever to drive and was, oh was cool because of its engine, because of the interior. No, it's actually, it's actually pretty engaging to drive. This is the might of decades of like serious Japanese engineering. Yeah. All being wrapped into one flagship of a, of a, something we never experienced. It's just fascinating to me that they went with a rotary for this thing, like of all things. I know that was a, that was like their engines, like this is the flagship, yeah. it makes sense to use that, but it's also just, you know, that, that was, was, they were winning Le Mans with that stuff. They really, there was every bit of evidence that they were like, no, this is right. Yeah. Mazda, for a very brief period, absolutely everything in the world was telling them, no, you're right. Yeah. Everyone else is crazy. Yeah. You're making money. You won the Ma with that you engine. You won the Ma. Why the hell wouldn't you put in your luxury flagship? Why wouldn't you put in the luxury flagship? This flag is the future. You're, you're the only one, Mazda. And then all of a sudden, all of that just disappeared. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's take a look under the hood, shall we? Yeah, let's see what this thing actually looks yeah. like. Because it's very rare to get a look at something like this. How often do you see a three rotor engine anywhere? Well, you don't. Here, that's it. Because this was the only production car with a three rotor engine. Look at this. There are luxury coupes which exist now. There are all sorts of things like this, but there are no three-rotor engine cars anymore at all. This None thing, since this. This thing is such a bruiser compared to that RX-7 we drove earlier. I mean, it is gigantic. It's huge. It is, it is, it's, for, it's a small engine for only two liters. It is like a very imposing looking two liters. Yeah, and it goes to show like, even the Supra, this is like way, way more ambitious than that. We are not gonna see a car like this anymore. Yeah, the common thread we keep seeing with all these bubble air cars is that they are products that can never happen again. Like yeah. you're never gonna probably see a Mazda RX-7 on that level. You'll, no. you'll never see a Toyota made Supra on that level. Well, I'll tell you, this is even more out there. Yeah. Mazda will never make a leather line, triple rotor, <laughs> ultra luxury coupe that has technology that nobody else had uh, 30 years ahead of its time. That will yeah. never happen again. This thing exists in amber and it is a product of a very special time that yeah. can never be repeated. Yeah, the bubble era hit a high that I don't think we're ever gonna see again. You wanna steal it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I want to change nice things. I wanna change my whole life for this car. Smart. <laughs>